Hello, everyone. Um, this is the seventh webinar of the series organized by the Bridging Science and Business Working Group of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. I want to thank uh, Marco and uh, the association for inviting me to uh, give this uh, lecture about the dark side of leadership, abusive supervision in the workplace. Um, the next webinar titled do I want to be an entrepreneur? Will take place on June 14th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, to register, please follow the link given in the YouTube chat. As we start this lecture, um, please log, on, log into YouTube if you want to send questions through the chat. After the, the webinar, the organizers will send you a link to a survey. It will only take you a really short period of time, some, something like one minute to fill it in and it's important. So uh, we really want to have your feedback. So we ask you to fill it in. Okay, so now to our lecture about the dark side of leadership, use of supervision in the workplace. Just to open the topic, um, I'd like to say that um, although this is a, uh, although this is a topic um, that's going to be, we are going to discuss negative um leadership behaviors however the end of this lecture is going to be optimistic i'm going to talk about change I'm, we're going to talk about what can be done to change the workplace to make behaviors in the workplace different so let's begin i'll start by telling you a bit about myself my name is efrat sultan mayor um I'm a, psych I'm a licensed psychologist as well as uh, an organizational consultant. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see my slides right now. Yes, I think you do now. So again, I'm a, I'm a licensed psychologist. I uh, am an organizational consultant. I do work with organizations as an organizational consultant and psychologist as well as teach and do research and um, I teach at IDC in Herzliya in Israel now in the School of Psychology, as well as the master's program in organizations de development and behavior. And I teach a multitude of courses in focusing on ethical conduct in organizations, the intersection between field work and the academia, as well as teamwork, leadership, and implementing strategy. So those are some of the fields uh, I specialize in. So the contents of our um, conversation today or of this uh, presentation, and uh, feel free to ask questions as, as uh, we continue. We're going to start with some introduction about the trends that are related to the importance of this topic and the reasons I think it's going to get much, much more attention in the near future. Then we're going to talk about what abusive supervision is, how important it is, how costly it is to individuals as well as organization, the complexity of this phenomenon, how to change the operations of organizations especially in order to make this happen less. I'll present uh, my study in this field and I'll, as I said earlier, I will take in your questions and ask and give you answers and hope to conduct this as uh, as a conversation. So I'll start with, I suppose you all know about Me Too. This is highly re relevant in this case because Me Too, um, the discussion about how negative sexual harassment is and how it impacts people to such a, a negative effect um, has gotten so much attention in the world, and I think it's just a start. It's just the starting point where negative behaviors get lots of attention and people retaliate against them. And sexual harassment can happen in the workplace as, as well as in other places. And other unethical behaviors, including managerial behaviors, seem to be even more prevalent prevalent in uh, sexual harassment. So this social trend of bringing up 
negative behaviors that are not acceptable anymore, I think is going to continue and that that makes discussing uh, unethical managerial behaviors in the workplace possibly one of the next topics that may be discussed um, globally. The next relevant trend is a technological one. The, the, when people are unhappy by the way they are treated in organizations by their managers, often they're not silent. They, they voice their feelings on social networks, of, of course. So it's really important for organizations to know that how people feel in their organizations will be voiced, will be known most probably in some cases. And if it happens a lot in, in an organization, you can expect it to happen even to have a larger impact than was possible when social networks were not that available. The next trend is globalization because we work in a world where people co can collaborate and work in the same organization from different countries, cultures, and um, operate together even as virtual teams. Culture impacts the way we see behavior. That means if you come from a culture where direct speech, saying exactly what you think is the norm, and you work with a colleague who comes from a culture where indirect communication is more the norm, having those two partners work together that could be complicated. They have may have misunderstandings of the meaning of behavior. So working in a global workforce has impacts on maybe possibly more misunderstandings where people do not understand the context of the intent of the person coming from a different culture. One more point is that high tech and medical and agricultural advancement has gone forward so much. And on the other hand, human behavior may be regarded as outdated today, hasn't moved that much forward as technology has. So today we have so, uh, so many other ways to operate socially and in the workplace. However, human behavior basically hasn't been attended to as much. So it may be the case that human behavior is outdated in terms of comparing the, the opportunities offered by technology and how we need to operate. There's some imbalance there between those two. The, adva the technological advancement, the medical advancement, in many fields, the advancement, and on the other hand, human behavior kind of remaining quite similar to what it was before. Um, so unethical behavior is unaccepted. And there is some more awareness that in organizations that organizational success and the quality of interpersonal behaviors are related. So that's, that's a good sign that there is a little more awareness but there needs to be much more. So I will make four central arguments today. One, abusive supervision is a central phenomenon, and I'll give you information, um, I'll provide information about, about why this phenomenon is so central. Next, I will describe the high costs that uh, organizations and individuals have from this phenomenon of abusive supervision. Next, I'll describe the phenomenon. And last, and I think that's important to note that that's the note of this uh, lecture, this webinar, is that change is possible. I believe change is possible, and I'll offer some uh, ways to, to make a difference. So let's start with the first claim, the first argument that this phenomenon of abusive supervision is central. So unethical workplace behaviors can, can come from a few different sources. They can come from clients. Clients often uh, put pressure, behave negatively, especially, especially for instance, if you go to call centers and um, people uh, encounter often or sometimes uh, neg highly negative unethical behaviors from clients. 
colleagues can behave unethical to one another. For instance, there can be a team that where one person is um, the scapegoat and continuously gets treated negatively. However, highest rates of unethical workplace behaviors are reported uh, in relation to managerial behavior in, so, in many places. Uh, in, for example, in Israel, the highest rates of unethical workplace behaviors are related to that of managers. Um, why is this relationship between a manager and his or her subordinate, why is it different? Why is it, uh, in what way is it unique? So this relationship is unique in, in that um, there's one person, the supervisor who has authority <coughs> and has uh, the ability to make decisions such as hiring someone, promoting that person, providing them with resources or not providing them resources, evaluating their performance, promoting them. And on the other hand, the subordinate does not have all those. So there's an imbalance of power between the two partners in that dyad. Um, what is abusive supervision? So I'll dig into the definition and, and give you some examples of behaviors. So abusive supervision is subordinates perception of the extent to which supervisors engage in, a, in the sustained display of hostile verbal and non-verbal verbal behaviors, excluding physical contact. Let's go one by one to the important parts of this definition. First of all, abusive supervision is subjective. That means it is perceived by the subordinate and evaluated as such. Next, it's not, if, you're, if your supervisor shouts at you once, that's not regarded abusive supervision. Abusive supervision is a behavior that continues again and again along a period of time. And it's hostile. It includes behaviors that are verbal as well as nonverbal. For example, um, disregarding someone is also abusive behavior, excluding physical contact. That means it does not include uh, physical aggression. What kinds of behaviors are included in abusive supervision? Making fun of someone, ridiculing them making negative comments about the subordinate to others, telling the subordinate he or she is incompetent, blame, blaming the subordinate to avoid responsibility, breaking promises again and again, disre disrespect through thoughts, feelings, ignoring a subordinate, invading their privacy in so many ways. Today, technology enables that uh, in different ways. Constantly reminding them of past mistakes, expressing anger while being mad at something else, and as well as social isolation. So all of those are examples for abuse supervision behavior. And I'd like to give you one example uh, of a case which I've uh, encountered in my work. Um, there was a CEO of a high-tech company who recruited a highly talented professional, John. Of course, that's not the real name, uh, with which he had worked in the previous job. That means the CEO knew that this was really a very, very good professional, and that's the reason he brought him to uh, the company. John was assigned to work in the R&D department as a team leader, leading the field of his expertise. His direct manager, VP of R&D, Jack, let's say that spread negative rumors about John, lied to him constantly, misinformed him on central matters critical for John's work. He denied the need, the needed resources uh, to do his job and constantly told him he was failing and that the team thought he was incompetent, disrespected his thoughts in public. Gradually, the abusive, became, the abusive behavior became more and more frequent and extreme. So that's one example. And I brought that ex example because I think it's uh, it demonstrates that really silent, aggressive behaviors can become a nightmare for an employee. Um, in this situation, uh, John felt 
a lot of his energy was invested in defending himself and instead of in his uh, great forte, which, which was um, in being creative, doing lots of uh, working well with people, he invested all his energy in defending himself from this negative behavior. The second example is a little different. It's uh, in, from the academia. Um, there was a head of faculty who humiliated a senior staff member in front of others. For, for example, uh, making fun of her professional comments in meetings, joking about her appearance, constantly blaming her for his own mistakes, ignoring her emails, not inviting her to social staff event, supposedly by mistake, constantly telling her it was time she retired. So that's more overt behavior of uh, abusive supervision. So those are two examples. One would be, the first would be relatively unseen to others, and however, it's, it's very abusive. And the other one is, uh, will be known to others as well, to bystanders. To people who view that. So abusive supervision is highly prevalent. In the US, about almost 14% of the US workers have reported that kind of behavior. And in Israel, um, in a similar, in a study that measured a similar type of behaviors, um, almost 37% of Israeli employees employees uh, described they were bullied by their supervisor. As a result of this, there are lots of adverse consequences for individuals as well as organizations. And that's a really important point because I think we all know that when you, you, you get negative treatment by your boss, there's impact on you. But I'm not sure to what extent organizations are clear about the fact that they are highly impacted as well and it's their interest that subordinates feel they're treated well. So that brings us to the next point, my next argument for this lecture, which is the high cost of abusive supervision. As I mentioned earlier, the consequences related to abusive supervision relate to individuals, as well as to organization. Um, for example, individuals' well-being goes down, their sa work satisfaction goes down, they, they experience more burnout. Um, they also uh, tend to retaliate. And for, for organizations, uh, there are high costs in terms of absenteeism. Often people are more sick. So if organizations in some states, in some countries, they pay health care costs, so the, their costs go, go up. Um, people, and I think one of the most important things for organizations to know, that people tend to uh, quit their jobs if they feel abused. And another important point is that bystanders also notice what's happening and they also know that today it's their colleague that's been abusively supervised, but tomorrow it can be them as well. So there's a probability that they also maybe uh, look for another job. That's the most, that's really something organizations really need to consider as a high cost because the people who leave first, organ, the people who leave organizations first are who. Usually those are the people who have the most opportunity, who are have high qualifications, and um, the people who are seeked in the workforce. And who do they live to? They usually have offers from competitors who value their experience, who value their knowledge. So that's something that's hard to quantify in terms of actual cost but it's really costly if your best leave or intend to leave the organization. That's a really high cost, and especially if they go to work to co with competitors. There are lots of ad additional consequences, but those are some of them. Just to give you a feel of uh, the cost of abusive supervision to both layers of parties, individuals as well as organizations. 
Next argument of mine was that abusive supervision is a complex phenomenon. When we try to understand why this abusive supervision happened, the answer is kind of complex. I'll start with something really important. Some managers behave abusively to their, super, to their subordinates because they lack knowledge, because they lack skills. They may have been the best professionals and have been promoted to a managerial position. However, nobody trained them to be a manager. And I find it kind of um, surprising that in order, for instance, in some countries, in order to drive a tractor, you need a license. You need to go specific. You need to go through specific training and then get your license. But to manage people, you don't need, you can just, you don't need a license for, for in every place. So some managers just don't know how to manage. So they don't necessarily have bad intent. However, some characteristics that were related to uh, abusive supervision, uh, which I've seen in my experience as well as read about, is um, an intentional way of achieving goals or influencing others by putting pressure. Um, additionally, managers may um, behave in a way that that is perceived very negatively because they have a preference for authoritarian styles because they believe that's the best way to manage people. Sometimes managers who are treated unfairly themselves behave abusively to their, to their subordinates and even they look at their... Uh, their own managers as role models and if they behave that way they actually imitate that stuff. So there are quite a few characteristics related to the supervisor that make it highly more probable that they'll behave abusively. Again, not all of them behave that way because they intend to. Some of them don't know, work in a stressful environment, are treated unfairly themselves, they're pressured, they're overworked, and that behavior happens without intent. But some of them do behave that way intentionally. It's important to know. Um, other individual characteristics ordinance um, that are more that tend to be uh, to experience negative emotions have been found uh, more susceptible. To abusive supervision. In my research, uh, I found that subordinates who have what's called attachment or neg uh, that have a certain style of attachment orientations, which are called anxious attachment orientations, where they need really, really tight relationships with lots of contact, with lots of attention, with lots of communication and support. And not provided that can sometimes in the workplace they don't they're not provided with that kind of relationship with their supervisor and they can tend to to have higher levels of evaluation of abusive supervision and that's what was found in my research. In addition, in addition to that, interpersonal interaction it makes sense that that's a factor which indeed was found in my uh, research related to lower well-being. When there's a high mismatch between supervisor and subordinate expectations in terms of the relationship or in, re in relationships in general, then well-being can go down, in my study, to very, very different, even negative and even opposite styles of expectations in relationship. One, who has avoidant attachment, meaning if, if you will, uh, the lone wolf or the, the people who really like to operate on themselves. And on the other hand, the anxious partner who needs a really, really close and tight and supportive relationship. Those two together, uh, when there's a mismatch, um, I found lower well-being in the relationship.
There are also factors at much higher levels, at an organizational level, and I'll discuss that in more detail uh, as I go into my own study. And even at social levels, in uh, some findings in my studies, again, related to immigrants reporting higher levels of abusive supervision. That could be because they do not understand the context of the managerial behavior, maybe viewing it as aggressive where it's not, or it's not intended to be, or they could be actually experiencing real higher levels of abusive supervision that result from them being different. And, um, causing their managers to behave in that way. Of course, none of these justify people being abusively supervised. Neither difference in culture nor being more sensitive. I think it's really important to state that the fact that one subordinate is more sensitive does not mean that it's justified to uh, abusively manage them. So at this point, I'd like to address um, some questions. First of all, the question was, um, lots of PhD, PhD students have to face with abusive PI. I'm assuming PI means uh, supervisor, um, PhD supervisor. So lots of PhD students have to face with abusive supervisors, and we don't have real tools to defend us. How can we stop abusive treatment? Can you suggest us real? Can you suggest real tools? In many universities, there are some policies, but if the supervisor is powerful, the student becomes weaker and weaker. Okay, so it's really important for me to say that before deciding to do something, it's really important to analyze what's happening there. As I mentioned just now, Abusive supervision is a complex phenomenon. There are lots of factors that can be at work there. So I would say think about it, think about what you expect from a relationship. I suggest consulting with a professional where you can openly and discreetly evaluate all the factors I discussed just before relating to your relationship expectations what you think the uh, supervisor's relationship expectations are, what happens in the dynamics between the two of you, what happens at the level of the organization, what's the ethical climate, what's the culture in which this happens. Um, only then, and after evaluating your options fully within the organization and what procedures and policies and what roles exist, and if you have, uh, if you have the option of consulting in the organization discreetly. Only then it's, it's valuable to make a, a very educated decision based on anal analysis of this sort. In addition, on, on an organizational level, it's important to note that I think organizations should have a person that performs a role uh, of, re of collecting or being open to getting complaints to receiving complaints about negative workplace behaviors. So to the next question. Abusive language is used towards an individual inside the EU, inside an EU supported organization due to that the individual pointed out some irregularities. The collective of the, of the organization mostly A supports this behavior due to the fear of their own role as the board of the organization is the cause of the irregularities, and B, it's silent. How, how to react in this matter if you have been warned not to say anything else? Um, I will relate to this question on two levels. One, on an organizational level, because this question has a really strong organization, uh, organizational part in it. So I'll start with that. So the described ethical climate doesn't sound like a caring one. It sounds that it sounds like uh, in that climate the differences in opinion are not accepted. In order for organizations to succeed, they really need, or it's important, it's really required that people are able to voice their opinions. That can be done or change, that change can be made where open communication is possible without punishing someone. Um, 
I suggest using organizational consulting to make that that choice and that change. It's really important to have open communications. In addition to that, um, it seems like it's really important in this culture to develop the possibility to learn, to learn from mistakes, to um, evaluate decisions as well as uh, allowing to make correction processes. It's really important for the quality of work because mistakes are part of human nature. So it sounds like that in this culture, if you make a mistake, it's really dangerous. So um, relating to the aggressive way of talking, aggressive talk is it's offensive to the victim and to the bystanders, as I said earlier. It should not be accepted. Again, I will say this structurally, it's important the organization should have a role that addresses complaints on abusive workplace behaviors. It's really, I think it's necessary if you want to deal with that. So um, to the next question, uh, will this seminar include sexual harassment through the supervisor? Sexual harassment is, a, is one form of negative workplace behavior. It's received a lot of attention lately. It can disrupt work to a high degree. It can disrupt performance, well-being, and drive away talented employees as well, um, and more. But it's not the topic of the lecture today, as it's not included in abusive supervision, as, as I defined it here. It's a very important phenomenon, but we won't deal with that in the lecture today. The last question for this part is, what is the best way to deal with a supervisor that displays a passive-aggressive kind of behavior? Um, well, it's important to analyze the situation fully before acting, as I discussed earlier. Um, looking at all dimensions, individual, the interaction between both parties, the organizational part, even the cultural part, and then understand what's happening in terms of the components of the supervisor's behavior. What's the subordinate's experience? Is it uh, to what extent is it obstructing the performance? What is the, the ethical climate in the organization? What are the alternatives that that you can actually of your operations? What can you do, and who can you turn to in the organization? Again. It's really important to analyze the situation well before you do something about it because it's a complex situation. Okay, so um, we'll move to the, the next phase of discussing the possibility of change. Um, I would like to say that it's time to change. We're in a, we are globally moving into places where people and people across the globe want to see changes in, in behavior and society. And the workplace is the place where we mostly, we invest a, a huge amount of our time and we don't, own, and people often don't go to work only to make a living, but they want to fulfill uh, who they are through the workplace. So it's time to improve, it's time to make a change and the change requires Co collaboration between uh, different parties within the organization, professionals without, from the external, external professionals as well. So the change I would recommend is related to prevention. That's my recommended choice. Why? First of all, because it's expected, I think it's really expected of organizations to have a healthy and successful work environment. And it makes sense, you go to work, to do a good job, most of us do, and you you need an environment that supports that, that supports the ability to be creative, to do a good job, to, to provide service, to provide innovation, to collaborate with others, to share information. That can be done much, much better in a healthy and ethical environment. Um, the other thing is that organizations will benefit so much from, from making that change because 
workers will be more motivated, they'll be most more satisfied, they'll do much more, they'll be more committed, most probably. So it's much better to prevent than to treat. So it's respected, it's expected of organizations to have a healthy working environment. The benefits will directly go to an to organizations as their workers will be more motivated and do a better job most probably and treatment is really expensive it takes lots and lots of time sometimes people are even have post trauma as a result of abusive workplace behaviors and that takes years uh, of treatment and often the treatment is unsuccessful people don't go back to work ever if they're they have post trauma um, so it's possible and it's likely to be effective those of you who sent questions I'll answer them in a few slides um, so how do uh, how does change happen what should organizations do first of all promote ethical leadership how first of all select people for leadership positions, for managerial positions, not only by evaluating their professional side, that means if, they're, uh, if they work in, in research, how good researchers are there, or, or how good are they in uh, their field of expertise, but also if you want to move them into a managerial position, it's really important that they know how to manage people. How do you do that? You train them, you evaluate them, you give them feedback pe periodically, you promote them according not only to the professional performance, but also in relation to their managerial performance. There's, it doesn't make sense to promote a manager who didn't do well with his subordinates when there were five of them to promote him to a job, or him or her, to a job where, where that person managed, manages now 50 people. Doesn't make sense, does it? So um, all those will support promoting ethical leadership. The next thing which I think is really important to do is to develop ethical codes. Now, um, the way to do that is to get people from different roles, from different levels of the organization involved. However, it's important to note that ethical codes depend on the context. They depend on the sector in which the organization operates in. Therefore, it's important to take the ethical environment in which that sector, that organization operates as a basis in order to highlight the most important parts of the ethical code. For instance, if you operate in the medical sector, then your dilemmas are highly different than that of a law firm. The next thing to do is to determine what kind of ethical climate you need to have in your organization and an ethical climate i'll talk about that in a minute when i talk about my study ethical climates relate to the ethical ethical parts of a, an organizational culture therefore it's really important that an organization develops an ethical climate that takes into consideration not only doing a good job not only the assignments and not only task-oriented approach, but also people-oriented approach. And that's, I will give you uh, information, further information about that later on. All these things can be done at a really, at a definition level, but most importantly, they need to be applied well. They need to be applied in everyday work. And that should be done by people who are professionals in that field, who know how to apply to, to promote change, who understand the phenomena at hand, who understand what unethical behaviors are and how to change the leadership, the, the codes of ethics, and the ethical climate in organization to actually make a real change, not only have posters on the wall stating your code of ethics, but actually making a change in people's behavior so and an additional and, and management needs to be determined in order to make that change so now to additional questions in the last years 
research integrity has been a very important topic that should be a must for all researchers. Do you think that with a proper research education, abusive supervision can be reduced? Well, I think it could be valuable to consider training related to effective research management, including inclusive and fair research management values as well as skills. If such training is provided, as well as other organizational aspects implemented, such as human-friendly ethical climate, I believe abuse of supervision will reduce, probably will reduce to a meaningful degree. And uh, research creativity and performance in general will actually benefit for that, from that kind of approach. Okay, so for more... Uh, an additional question now. Um, how to protect yourself if your colleagues have private, okay, uh, have private post relationship? How would you protect yourself if your colleagues have private close relationship, like family friendship, with your supervisor and on purpose they share lies about your behavior? That sounds really bad. Um, again, you need to analyze the full situation. It sounds like um, a situation in which the climate can be very uh, positive to work in. And sharing negative comments about a worker could be damaging. However, it's really important to analyze what's happening in that organization. How is it possible? What's the organizational climate there? Is that just happening in your unit or does it happen everywhere? If so, the solution is not individual, it's organizational. So take that into note. It's not always possible. It's not possible to resolve an organizational issue at an individual level. Again, make sure you evaluate what the situation is on all levels, individual, yours, your experience as well as the behavior of a supervisor, what happens with your colleagues, what happens in terms of the organizational climate, and then make a choice what to do. Um, where to seek help or make complaints about your supervisor behavior if the organization and institute where you work ignores your emails denying the psychological help. Well, I think that's a case where you need to get external consulting about what to do because it sounds like you can't, and I'm, I mean, go for discrete consulting externally because it sounds like the organization doesn't have a function that deals with that. Um, How to protect oneself if a person is abusively supervised? Exit the job will be a sustainable damage for a career. The job is short-term, contract two years. Again, all my individual answers will, ha will have that recommendation of first evaluating the situation. Evaluate what's happening, then evaluate your options within the organization. I suggest doing that with somebody who's external to the organization do external consulting where you have that ability to remain uh, discreet. It sounds like these organizations should have a change within them. Okay, I'm moving to the next step in terms of research. Abusive supervision that was evaluated in a healthcare organization in Israel. The team of researchers included myself. Professor Mario Mikolinser from IDC, Professor Anos Drory from the Ben Gurion University. Um, the purpose of this research was to examine the contributions of intrapersonal, inter, within the person, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and organizational level factors to abusive supervision, to, to abusive supervision and its consequences. I'll say that again. The purpose of this study was to examine the contributions of intrapersonal, interpersonal, and organizational level factors to abusive supervision and its consequences. The consequences of abusive supervision that were evaluated in the, in the current study 
were well-being, burnout, satisfaction, absenteeism, and intentions to quit. All those were evaluated by the consequences for subordinates. Um, the antecedents that were uh, evaluated in these in this study were related to the factors I described earlier, individual characteristics, interpersonal interactional characteristics, social factors, and what I'll focus on right now is organizational factors. As I claim throughout this lecture, the meaningful change comes from the organizations. They need to provide other kinds of environments other kinds of organizational environments. And now I will show you the results on which this notion is based. So the organizational factor that was evaluated in this study was ethical climate, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a part of organizational culture that relates to ethical issues. Now, there are there have been found five types of ethical climates that were found in the field in organizations, although theoretically there were more. And the two types which uh, were mainly evaluated in this study were instrumental climates, where ethical decision making is made from an egotistic perspective, serving the individual, his or her immediate group and organization, without regarding the detrimental results to others, uh, these are the less preferred uh, ethical climates, the least preferred ones. Another type of ethical climate is caring ethical climates, where decisions, policies, practices, and strategies are based on the concern for the well-being of others within the organization as well as society at large. These are our employees' most prefer preferred work climates. So let's look at the results and see what happens in terms of uh, abusive supervision and consequences of abusive supervision. Well, from these two uh, ethical climate perspectives, evaluated by subordinates and by supervisors. So when subordinates evaluated a caring, the higher they evaluated a caring ethical climate, the less abusive supervision they perceived, the more they evaluate, the higher they evaluated their well-being, they reported lower levels of burnout and higher levels of satisfaction. On the other hand, supervisors who evaluate, the higher they evaluated instrumental ethical clients, the higher the reports of abusive supervision. So we can clearly see that Caring ethical climate is negatively related to abusive supervision and its negative consequences, whereas instrumental ethical climate is positively related to abusive supervision. That gives you a direction of why it's important to implement ethical climates which have a component of caring within them. Ethical climates that are based only on achieving results without regarding people are positively related in the study with abusive supervision. Um, in terms of next steps, it's really important in order to promote the change, and some of you asked me about how possible is the change. The change is possible, but it ha it requires two things. First of all, it requires future research and it also requires applying change in organizations. Now these can be done in parallel. Right now, as you noticed, I made recommendations on, on what kinds of changes can actually change those negative managerial workplace behaviors, abusive supervision. So I made some recommendation and their application is expected to make some some difference and possibly meaningful different, and that needs to be evaluated. So that's related to future research as well. One step in, in research could be evaluating different types of, uh, of techniques to change the workplace. 
and then evaluating their impact in terms of abusive supervision, as well as other unethical behaviors and their consequences. All this needs to be done in organizations because the arena in which these behaviors actually happen are in organizations, in workplaces. Therefore, these studies mostly should be done or especially should be done in the field where these behaviors actually happen. However, it's complex to conduct studies on negative workplace behaviors in our organizations. And it's really important to know how to promote that kind of study on this kind of topic of negative workplace behaviors within an organization. So it's really important to do these studies in organizations. However, you need to know how to conduct them in a way that will actually bring clear and reliable results. And I think it's really important to apply that change, to make a difference. And it is the right time to do that. We're in a world that strives for other kinds of behaviors. Um, I'm going to now go back to some more questions. Um, what to do when you are just a temporary employee? It happened that me or my colleagues were just told, if you don't like it, change your job. We don't want to oppose a permanent employee. So seem, the work conditions here seem unoptimal, to say the least. And within those conditions, I think you should operate in terms of understanding what the roles are in the organization, who takes um, who's responsible for that kind of, uh, of, of complaint. And if you were told that um, that's the situation, it's kind of so it doesn't sound like a good situation for you. Again, this sounds on an organizational level as unethical. It sounds like uh, this organization requires a change of ethical climate where people should be regarded as people as well as good performers and people who do a good job. The next question, what to do if someone from outside of institution interferes with the relationship through sending emails, belittling the student, for instance, an old competitor and supervisor believe, the supervisor believes her claims about the student. Sounds like, uh, again, this is a situation, uh, I, I think, this doesn't sound like abusive supervision. It sounds like negative rumors about that student, uh, which should be dealt with uh, with thought. And I think from an organizational perspective, it's, it's again important to educate managers what to do in terms of how to evaluate their own workers, what to do with rumors, what to do with information about them. It sounds like it's really important the managers in that organization actually learn how to manage. A rumor doesn't have to be an actual fact, and you can actually make misuse of information which was given for this reason or the other. So training managers about how to manage their, their employees and how to use information about them is important. Um, I would like to say that um, this lecture was uh, based on this lecture was based on some of the publications of uh, the the first one is a book of that relates to different countries around the globe, including Australia, New Zealand, um, India, Europe, and uh, the, the wonderful editors who uh, edited this book, uh, Professor Mario Omari and uh, Megan Paul. They both uh, invited us, uh, Professor Mario Michelinzer and myself, to write a chapter about negative workplace behaviors in Israel, so that get, if you are in, interested in the cultural, the different cultural perspective, that's a good book uh, to look into, and you may get even 
look into your own culture and what goes on there. Another uh, chapter that I recommend is the one about abusive supervision uh, in Israel relating to immigration, seniority, and duration of relationship with supervisors. It's uh, in a book about contemporary perspectives in co corporate social performance and policy, uh, edited by, uh, uh, I, hope, I hope I say this right, by Satovich and Stanoj uh, and Aman. And again, it gives you a different perspective from a, a corporate social performance point of view. Um, another part of uh, another perspective is about bullying as social influence arena. Again, this is from a bullying perspective, and but it does relate to abusive supervision. Uh, it was uh, a recent article published by uh, Jermaine, Jermaine Wilk uh, and uh, Wilk and myself. And we evaluated social influence tactics occurring in the bullying process. So I would like to recommend those readings. Um, one more question, just as we end: um, How do how supervise how can supervisors find out, find out if they are acting abusively without noticing? What a wonderful question to finish with. I'm, I thank that person for asking because I'm assuming that person is a supervisor. It's really important that organizations have feedback. Uh, it's called the 360 degree feedback, where you get feedback from your employees, from your subordinates, from your colleagues, as well as your managers. I think everyone needs to get feedback from all directions. That gives you a good perspective on how you're operating. And again, you don't, don't expect to know how to manage people if you haven't been trained. You could be lucky enough to know that intuitively, but it's reasonable to expect organizations to provide you with training. So if you're a manager, um, I suggest, I suggest you, uh, ask your organization to provide training of that sort. So uh, it seems like we've our time has ended and there are no further questions. Um, I'd like to conclude again with thanking uh, the Marie Curie uh, organization, uh, Alumni Association for inviting me for this lecture. The next webinar titled, Do I Want to Be an Entrepreneur? will take place on June 14th at 1.30 p.m. To register, please follow the link given in the YouTube chat. In a few minutes, you'll receive a link to a survey. It will only take one minute to fill it in, and it's very important for you, uh, for us to have your feedback. So we appreciate it if you do. And I'd like to thank you for joining us here uh, for this webinar and um, for all your wonderful questions. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Goodbye.